be here. We're <clears throat> a little bit disoriented, I think, coming all the way from the Valley of the Sun, Mesa, Arizona, and uh, to realize that uh, you have a lot of rain here. We were uh, just overwhelmed flying in. There was just clouds and clouds and clouds, and then we finally it came down, 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 and finally there was this greenery. I mean, it is green here. I don't think you have any idea how green it is when you come from the desert and then you come down into this uh, out of the clouds and it's so green it hurts your eyes. I mean, it is just beautiful. And so I really have enjoyed, even though it took us a day and a half to get here, uh, airport closed and all the chaos of uh, people jammed in and upset because their flights are canceled and all the ex excitement and adventure of finding a place to sleep and and hoping the flight will make it in this morning and and uh, it is worth it just to be here and meet uh, the different ones we've already had the privilege of of uh, having a little nap there in uh, uh, pastor craig's home and and meeting his wife and i think i've met all of his children it seems like it really is a growing family <laughs> so i was very impressed with all that's happening there um, it has been my privilege for almost 30 years now to be involved in Latin America. And I do have a great love for Latin America and the different countries. We spend about uh, a month of the year in either Nicaragua or Cuba or Colombia or Peru or Mexico or uh, in uh, one of the different Latin American countries. And there are a number of uh, great needs. As you probably already know, Latin America, as far as the evangelical church, is the fastest growing church in the world. And yet at the same time, there's tremendous fanaticism. And meaning by that, that much of what we had with appearances of Mary and all the superstitious popular religion of Latin America has come over into somewhat evangelical kind of languages with just appearances of Jesus. And yet at the same time, there's tremendous heartfelt needs that are great in Latin America. Uh, we're involved right now with with translating and publishing a number of important works. Uh, Professor John Murray's uh, collected writings. Um, some of you that have looked at war psalms, it really does have a great deal of help for those who live in a politically distressed part of the world with dictators and oppression and all the needs. How do we pray for our leaders? How are we involved in the culture? How do we pray these psalms? And so we really believe there's a, a need to have that volume translated into Spanish. We're also involved in a 25-volume uh, publishing event in Latin America, a particular Argentine who lived he, not too far from here in Palos Heights in Chicago area. He was the voice of the uh, Laura de la Reforma, the Back to God Hour in in Spanish for almost 30 years on 500 stations in Latin America. Probably some 50 million people listened to Juan Boonstra, uh, a man that uh, for all those Dutchmen to trust him, um, he had to have been one educated uh, by them and at the same time with a, a Dutch name, but he grew up in the Pampa area of Argentina and he was an artist with the Spanish language, just beautiful. And there is a, a publishing project that we're involved with. We're seeing 25 volumes of his sermons with 52 sermons per volume um, published. And it will be like a great help for Latin pastors who usually have just a few years, maybe fifth grade education, one year, two years of Bible college, and then they have 150 people. And after they've preached their 10 sermons five or six times, it becomes with quite a bit of fanaticism and they haven't had that instruction how to preach from God's Word. And so we believe these sermons will be a practical guide from a Latin American who can give them direction in preaching from God's Word. Now, there again, we're thankful that our Lord Jesus Christ is the one who is the mighty victor. We know the reality that there is one who makes war with the Lamb, but the Lamb will overcome. Our Lord Jesus Christ is the one with whom we have victory, and those that are with him 
are called and faithful and chosen. And we have that great reality as we open God's word this afternoon. I would ask you to open the word of God to Genesis chapter 1. <clears throat> and I would like to read from this familiar passage with the reality that in Scripture, God is called by the Hebrew word hamavdil. And if you'd like to have a transliteration of that Hebrew word, you can spell that H A. M-A-V-D-I-L, Hamavdil. And it really has to do with the one who draws lines. And God is a God who draws lines. And we look to him as the one who gives us the lines that we need to focus upon and see clearly in this new century. Those lines are being blurred in the church of Jesus Christ. And in the world, they're being erased, blotted out altogether. And we need to see those lines that God has drawn. We need to see them clearly. Lines God has drawn as an artistic creator of all that is. We read in God's word, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Then we read again these words all the way through God's creation of how he drew lines. We read in verse 26, then God said, let us make man in our image. In our likeness, let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it and to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air and all the creatures that move on the ground, everything that has breath of life in it. I give every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. And then we read, thus the heavens and the earth were com completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work, and God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. First, we see as we read through this that God draws lines of separation between himself and that vast array of creation. And that is fundamental for us to understand the world that we live in. He drew lines through the entire reality of the universe. And the world seeks to blur or erase those lines from the reality that we live with. Lines of distinction, lines of demarcation, lines of design that God has put there very clearly in all of the world. Now, I believe as we live in this new century, there are going to be battle lines that we're going to have to face. We're going to have to be very careful and see those battle lines and stand up for the truth where those lines of truth are being blurred or erased. We must not sit at ease in the church 
while these lines that God has drawn are being blurred and erased. There must be a return to those lines that God has given us. Now, it's very easy for us sometimes to get all rattled about certain things, and people can get very involved in different causes, and they can get up in arms about little things that may be part of their own list. We even do that sometimes, at least some of us, in areas of politics and different areas that we are maybe part of a conservative political uh, area and very important, we can get ourselves very involved in these things. And certainly as citizens of our country, there are things we need to be involved in. But I would speak to you this afternoon about lines that God has drawn. Sometimes we have our own opinions, we have our own preferences, we have those things that we think are very important, that we enjoy and like. But there are things that are so fundamental that it's really not our choice whether we're going to be part of this. But as Christians, we must stand up for those things. And I'm not speaking here again of just old traditional things that somehow or another you're supposed to be involved in the old paths as far as old phrases and, and to be committed to a certain kind of uh, uh, speech or something of that nature that we would identify as being very conservative. The Word of God is living, and it is revolutionary. And we're constantly to be having that Word reform our lives and our churches. We are not to dam up the Word of God and give it our own lines in which it can function. This Word of God is powerful. We can't control it. It is the creative Word of God. And so on the one hand, I'm saying we must turn back to those lines that God has drawn and see those lines clearly. But on the other hand, I'm not speaking of the lines that have merely been drawn by men. Those lines may need to be blurred or erased altogether. We're not the followers of any men. But at the same time, I believe God's Holy Spirit has been at work down through the centuries. The Spirit of God didn't come last week or a hundred years ago. The Spirit of God has been at work in His church all down through these centuries, and He's had His people. He's had those who have stood up for His truth. And we stand upon the shoulders of Augustine and those great doctrines of grace. Salvation is of the Lord. We stand upon the shoulders of those we speak of as the Reformers or later the Puritans, the Covenanters. We stand upon the shoulders of those who stood for the truth. A man such as a Spurgeon in the last century. We stand in a great line of those who have stood for God's truth. And yet it's a revolutionary, reforming, fresh word of God. We are not to impersonate those of the past or impersonate our favorite minister today. In fact, having read a great deal of Jonathan Edwards, even if we could somehow or another have a video of Jonathan Edwards, and we could listen to it. Now, it would be interesting in a historical sense, but the preaching of God's Word comes from this pulpit each Lord's Day. It comes in your churches, wherever you may be a part of, and it's a living Word from this Word of God that comes to you where you are. So as we look at this word that is alive today and we think of the issues that we're going to face as Christians in this century before us and as we would honor those who've gone before us by returning to the lines that God has drawn, I would ask you to look once again at the creation lines. <clears throat> 
God has drawn a line between himself and his creation. The first line I would have you see is that line that God has drawn between himself and his creation. There is no line more important for us to see in our day than this line. We have coming into the church a blurring of that line in all kinds of mysticism, Gnostic teaching. It's coming in even to the church. It's not just out there in the world. It's in the teachings that are going forth in different churches and congregations, even those churches that would seem to have a great historic past. There is a compromise that is taking place. God has drawn a line between himself and his creation. We need to have that thunder in our minds, in our thinking as Christians. God is not his creation, and his creation is not God. He is not it, and it is not he. There is a distinction, this essential issue for our time. When it is blurred, we have what has come to be such a powerful influence in the last century, evolution came to reign, came to take center stage in our culture. We know that. But it really came as a theory from that snake that crawled out of the 19th century called pantheism. That pantheism really does blur all the distinctions it obscures all those boundary lines that God has given to us. All becomes God, and all kind of becomes this Mother Nature or this Mother Earth, and there is this feeling that God is everywhere and everything is God, and it's a very religious feeling. Pantheism. That's what eliminates God's line of distinction and it is a present reality in our culture today. You can talk about Mother Earth or Mother Nature, and people are right there with you. It doesn't offend anyone. It's part of our culture today. But in evolution, we find that there is that snake that has been part of the human desire down through the many centuries to somehow or another eradicate God from our presence. As covenant breakers, that we could get rid of God from our thinking. The human heart constantly seeks to rid itself of God. Humanity makes itself God, and it's really pantheistic to the core. There is a way of thinking that the evolutionist denies God and denies that line of distinction between creation and God. And our faith as Christians needs to be a living faith in the God who created everything that is. And he created it with design and purpose. Our faith really stands or falls on recognizing, focusing clearly on this line that God has drawn between himself and his creation. God created this line. That great Christian thinker and theologian who was prime minister of the Netherlands in the early part of this century, Abraham Kuyper, has written very succinctly to this issue when he says, God himself is the ultimate boundary for all his creation, and to erase boundaries is virtually the same as erasing the idea of God. Thus, however true it is that modern philosophy began with doubt and, is not ended, and has now ended in despair, the entire pantheistic stream has left behind on its shores a toxic slime and it is precisely in Darwin's theory of evolution that its deposit manifests its power. Now we know that the whole thinking of evolution and Darwinism in all of its different forms 
is part of our culture. And yet we as God's people need to enjoy the truth we have. I would encourage you not to bury your head in the sand and somehow or another think that all is lost. We really do have a word to speak in this world of pantheism. We have something to say that's powerful. I would encourage you to read not only the older volumes of Abraham Kuyper and, and uh, Charles Hodge and a B.B. Warfield concerning evolution, <clears throat> but I think there's certainly the books of our day that uh, the Creation Research Society has done uh, that have been about for the last 30 or 40 years, many helpful things there. But I'd also encourage you to read some of the newer volumes I'm sure that some of you are familiar with of Darwin's... Uh, uh, I guess uh, the, the one that uh, has been such a great help and encouragement and enjoyable volume to me is Darwin's Black Box by Michael Behe. And I would encourage you, maybe that's not your field, but read through the volume. You'll enjoy seeing how this world that has been so influenced by evolution has really stopped trying to even give explanations how all this could possibly have come about this complicated world that we live in. They don't even attempt to give an explanation how it could have come about this to this next step, to the next step in all of this. It's some grandiose philosophical thinking, but they're not even giving any practical explanation. Or Philip E. Johnson's books, uh, Darwin on Trial, certainly a, an excellent volume. Uh, it's a good volume to have in your home just to... Uh, I think give to some of your friends who would uh, look for someone with credentials in the whole area of logic and reasoning. He's a man that uh, uh, certainly comes with credentials. Uh, uh, I think one of his uh, degrees is from Harvard, another is from the University of Chicago. He was uh, uh, a clerk for Chief Justice Earl Warren, uh, has been a professor of law at the University of California, Berkeley, for 30 plus years and uh, you know, here are these liberal credentials. But when he begins to look at the evidence of Darwinism, it's a powerful volume. I would just encourage you, the whole theory that has taken over our culture is what really produced the Holocaust. The whole thinking behind the super race comes from that philosophical understanding. We have the truth. God has drawn a line. He is this majestic, sublime, great creator of all that is. And he is not his creation. We have a true, living God that has revealed himself to us. We are not to be silent. A second issue, I think, that comes from this foundational passage for our understanding all of life is that line that God has drawn in gender and marriage. Certainly, if you want to find those issues that are being fought and battled over in our great denominations of our land today, that is one of those cardinal areas. Churches that we thought, here is orthodoxy, Churches that have been the rear guard of truth and orthodoxy, and they're sliding. We read God's Word, and we have that wonderful vision or passage given to us in its majesty there that God created man, male and female, in the image of God. There is that equality that is involved there. There is a beauty to those very statements that are given to us. And God said that it was all very good. And in marriage, the man and the woman, they become one flesh. And then there are those roles that are given by God. And I would remind you that the voice of the church of Jesus Christ needs to be lifted up constantly against all the substitutes whether they be substitutes of adultery or pornography or 
all those ugly, perverted areas of homosexuality and whatever nice names they may give it, it's still an abomination before God. And we, though it may cost us dearly, have that privilege to lift up our voices against those foul perversions of the beauty of God creating man and woman in his image and that there is this institution of marriage by which a man and a woman become one and form a family. God has given us this and in the reality of it there is the equality and at the same time glorious inequalities. The man's role and the woman's role. There is a distinction, a line drawn between a man is not a woman and a woman is not to be a man. Now that almost sounds absurd, but those of you who live in that workaday world, you know. Here are some people, that's what they want to be, is exactly what they're not. They're not content with being this, they want to be this. And they go contrary to nature itself. My son, who's... Uh, been an attorney for a number of years in international law, works in Chicago. As he speaks to me with sadness at times, he says, Dad, the women, they want to be men. They're ashamed of being women. And the men don't know what they want to be. What a sad time we live in. And yet we have this Word of God that gives us that artistic line that's been drawn by God Himself. These distinct roles. This, I would say to you this afternoon, is a really big issue. Really big. If I would ask you the question this afternoon, what is the biggest change that's taken place over the last 60, 70, 80, 90 years. Certainly some of you could put forward different ideas. I can remember being, as I was raised by my grandfather, he drove a Model T across the country and into Arizona in 1919, and he could tell me about all these old cars and and to go to an old car show and have him tell you something about those cars and all the background and what a transformation, the automobile. What a great, amazing change it's brought to the United States of America and to the world. Or others of you here, I'm sure, work in computers and what a transformation. Our whole uh, computer system, uh, two weeks ago today, the electric company was working out front of our church and boom, we lost it all. Whew, rough Friday afternoon. They're going to retrieve this and they're going to pay for these things, but we've been down for two weeks. Everyone's kind of, well, what do we do? Computers have changed a lot of things. Airplanes. TVs. Think about it a moment. Great wars, changes, the fall of communism, incredible advances in science and technology. What's the most significant change that's taken place in our time? William Manchester, a very skilled analyst of cultural trends wrote recently that the changes that have occurred in the relationships of men and women are the most significant. The years he surveyed are those between 1933 and 1993. Manchester says, quote, the erasure of the distinctions between the sexes is not only the most striking issue of our time, it may be the most profound the race has ever confronted. If Manchester, if as he has pointed out, the change in the roles of men and women is perhaps 
the most profound the race has ever encountered, it is surely true that the feminist theology that is coming into churches and being put forth daily from our seminaries, from our newspapers, all across our country is a profoundly dangerous movement in our churches. Now, I, I uh, certainly don't know all the uh, positions of different churches here, but there are changes that are coming. There are issues that we need to stand up and make our voice clearly heard with God's word in our hand and say no to ungodliness. Changes that are coming. There are battle lines that are worth standing for. We believe that God's word is the only authority. It is the final authority. We believe in that great and glorious principle of sola scriptura. And yet many others believe that what we have here and they even have that name evangelical, that what we have here is an evolving cultural book. And that was okay for Paul in his day, but we have made great progress. We have the equality of women, as they would speak of it, the Gnostic writings that they would go back to that are not found in God's Word the evolving view of the Bible that they have, that it's really just a product of man's evolving thought. There's progress. Therefore, a rejection of the cultural parts of the Bible as they would see it. The whole uh, understanding of God as he's revealed himself as our Father in heaven, his sending his Son to die for sinners the whole concept of that culture that was prepared in which God reveals himself to us. And we, yes, in that one who is the firstborn of all creation, in that one who has those rights as the firstborn son, and in him we have all those rights and privileges. This book is in that sense, and I use the term carefully, man-centered. There is a sense in which this is the God-centered book of all books. But there is another sense in which when we speak of a male-centered revelation that God has given to us that brings dignity ultimately to both men and women, that's what this book teaches. Now, you may disagree with this book, and you may go to Gnostic writings, the Gospel of Thomas, or other writings, and come with something that may be quite different. But you will not, you will not, I repeat, get away from that teaching if you stay with God's Word alone. Scripture alone will never come up with God being either father, mother, in the sense that the feminists are speaking of today. There are battle lines that seek to come and change our translations. Publishing houses that are changing their great position they've held for years. Seminaries that have been meccas of teaching of the Word of God, and they're changing their positions. Churches. The Old Testament scriptures were given in the midst of all kinds of pagan feminine deities. But there was a word constantly being given against these female goddesses of the pagan neighbors. This word of God was given contrary to all that culture against Astarte, Istar, Isis, or even the New Testament clearly, in a culture that was very much a part of the feminine goddess. Diana, Demeter, Athena, Juno, all feminine goddesses. It's not that it was 
part of the culture. No, this word of God was contrary to the culture. Certainly, we must speak to the abuses in the churches, in our culture, when women are abused and not given that dignity and that place of honor that God has for them in his word. A prominent place they have in the history of redemption. A prominent place they had in the New Testament as they were helpers and working with the apostles and the leaders of the churches to gather the people of God. But there must be that line of distinction in the genders, men and women. Both in the home and in the church, there is a great important line that God has drawn. It's not that you could say to me this afternoon, come on, Grizzly Adams, hey, let's work together. Let's just get along with everybody. And I don't like controversy. I don't like to confront people. I enjoy people. I don't want to fight with anyone. But it's not my decision. It's not yours. God's word has drawn a line. This distinction is given to us. And we cannot adapt or accommodate to this feminist theology. Paul, of course, is the one they say very plainly, I quote, Paul is wrong, unquote. I ask you, if you believe the Bible, that the Bible is our ultimate authority for spiritual life and that we must submit to its teaching, you have to live according to it. Followers of Christ filled with the Holy Spirit are stuck with the Bible. It's there, this teaching. Our only spiritual authority that we have is God's Word. That's the only revelation that God has given to us written. Read the Bible through 25 times, 30 times. You'll find it's contrary to the whole of this feminist theology that's entering into our churches. Contrary. It's the only spiritual authority we have, and if we start playing games with it, we will put our spiritual lives and the spiritual lives of our children in great danger for years to come. We must remain faithful. Women are indispensable. In our homes, in our churches, we are to honor them, work together. We are to take Proverbs 31 and see that woman that is to be praised. But there is a distinction in the roles that men and women have been given by God. And if we blur that line of distinction that God has drawn and follow that feminist theology of today's church and create a form of Christianity that has moved beyond the scriptures. What will happen to the next generation? What may appear to be more beautiful, a more beautiful picture for the female members of the church? What may appear to be a step forward will in fact be a disfiguration, not only of the church, but of women, of every woman that walks that path a serious deformation for the entire body of Christ. We read that apostolic saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6. Look it up with me. Turn in your Bibles. See that apostolic saying that tells us with all that clarity that we need constantly to have in our ears and our minds, do not go beyond what is written. Man has that curiosity, or he wants to improve God's word. And we need that apostolic admonition. Do not go beyond what is written. The church is nothing if it does not have the Bible. 
The Spirit-inspired Word of God mediates the very presence of Christ among us. All of us, men and women, need the discipline of the Scriptures if we are to survive. The greatest disservice we could do for one another would be to substitute, to substitute a religion of our own making for the religion that God has revealed to us. Don't blur the line of distinction between men and women. There's a third line, and I would... uh, not be real sure of our time, how we're doing. If uh, we have five minutes, ten minutes, where are we? Just uh, don't see. uh, We'll uh, run just a little bit, but I want to look at the last part of Genesis, chapter 1, and the beginning of chapter 2, and refresh your mind that there is here this rest and worship lines. In Genesis 2, verses 1 through 3, we have that regulatory principle in one sense that God begins to reveal to us this day that is holy as he calls it. And as we see that history of redemption, there is this regulatory principle that I would remind you of very briefly, and maybe you're very familiar with what has been used in a terminology of a a principle, the regulatory principle. We would speak in this sense that when an oriental king would have his subjects come into his presence, he determines who comes into his presence. He determines how they come and what form and and how they come before him and all those things about that. This one who is the great king, this great covenant king, God the Lord over all creation, he determines how we are to worship him. Now, it may seem to you that it's really neat to come up with some new way to worship God. And uh, here's something that's really neat, and we'll do it like this, and no one's ever worshipped him like this, and we'll create this, and we'll come up with another invention. Colossal pride. We think we can tell God how he's been worshipped better than he's told us how we are to worship him. That term colossal pride. We all have pride and we grapple with it. Anyone who says they don't, they're lying. We have to ask God's forgiveness because pride sneaks into our minds and lives. And we're constantly praying, Lord, forgive me. That wasn't right. The way I thought. But this is a terrible idolatry, this pride of thinking we can create a way of worshiping God that's better than what he's told us. He's given us, in a special way, his revelation of a day of rest. And I'm not here to deal with that whole area of controversies of those who have uh, uh, questions about God's moral law and this day of rest. And some are polarized one direction, some another, and some are pitted against the others. I'm here to speak to you with a line of distinction that God has given to us. We are to work those six days, and there is to be a day of rest, of worship, a holy day. God says, after he had created everything, he said it was very good, and then he rests. God rests from his work. And that does not mean that tired, worn out by all the creative work, God took time off. Not somehow or another he was burned out and he needed something, but that was a holy day, a work of creation stopping point in a sense It's finished. It says he completed it all. (coughs) It reminds us even of that Lord Jesus Christ to tell us die. It is finished. That work of redemption. It's complete. 
it's done. God signals that he will maintain and give life, but the work of creation is finished. The day of rest tells us that man, men and women, man, is not the goal of creation. Everything begins and ends with God. In the beginning, God created, and in the end, God rested. This work of creation sets the stage for the divine work of salvation. God rests. Jesus says, it is finished. Salvation, redemption, in its totality is all complete and finished and done. There is now this imperial day, the day of the Lord, the resurrection day of worship. It gathers up the significance of the creation day of rest and the exodus day of redemption. And it makes that day a day of worship it's transformed into a celebration of Jesus' resurrection from the dead. The first day of every week, the church met together. There is that imperial day. He is Lord over all creation and over his people. He arose from the dead. This day of worship is drawn for us as a line between work and worship. It becomes a sign of that New creation completed in Jesus Christ. A greater redemption than all that God had done before. Now it's greater, it's fuller, it's complete in Jesus Christ. It is a sign of that new covenant sealed by the blood of Jesus Christ. The church met every first day of the week. There was rest. There was worship, there was wonder, there was celebration. He is Lord. He has dominion. He is Lord. A line for worship has been drawn. We live in a day. I don't know, maybe it doesn't even happen out here. Maybe it's a phenomenon of the West wide open spaces and there's freedom and everybody does it their way. But in our Valley of the Sun there, we have churches now that, well, we have Saturday night services because they can then use all day Sunday for all the recreation. And besides, the Diamondbacks are playing on Sunday afternoon. We have those who've even moved it back further. We have a Thursday night service so you can have the whole weekend free. I'm not here battling with a day. That's not my purpose this afternoon. But God has drawn a line for a day of worship. To worship Him as the covenant Lord. And if we blur that line, and suddenly God just fits in like a dental appointment on Thursday. My schedule is so busy, I don't have time to give God a day of worship. Something's horribly wrong. He's not our dentist. He's not our doctor. He's not grocery shopping, fitting him in to our schedule. The word is given. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another all the more as you see the day approaching. We are to find a resting place. Jesus calls us to rest in him, to come to him. And we will do great damage to the church of Jesus Christ if we don't maintain that clear line of doing our work. Yes, working, laboring, but also just as fervently worshiping and enjoying our great God. Now, it's certainly true that we need, I believe, a time uh, that goes 
without speaking of emphasizing that the, the gospel is the gospel of God's grace from beginning to end. This wondrous salvation of God's free grace. But I do believe that the church of Jesus Christ is going to face issues in these days concerning creation, the roles of the gender, male and female, and how we are to really worship God as the Lord. These issues we must face and we must stand even, even if we stand alone and stop counting heads. But do the truth, no matter what it costs us. Let me give you a quotation from the old governor himself, Charles Haddon Spurgeon. There was a volume that I read in the summer of 1966. We were preaching in Scotland that summer, and we came across a volume called The Forgotten Spurgeon. And we would stay up late at night, and we lived in a, an old gospel Europa van, and uh, we'd have to uh, not bring the battery down so low we couldn't get it started in the morning by reading till the wee hours. And uh, we had a fire, though, that was lit in our hearts that summer. A fire to see God's truth go forth. Spurgeon has these words, I believe, that are for us. I take from that old book that I read that summer in 66. Spurgeon says, we admire a man who, has, who was firm in the faith, say, 400 years ago, but such a man today is a nuisance and must be put down. Call him a narrow-minded bigot or give him a worse name if you can think of one. Yet imagine that in those ages past, Luther, Zwingli, Calvin, and their, their peers had said, the world is out of order, but if we try to see it, set it aright, we shall only make a great row and get ourselves into disgrace. Let us go to our chambers, put on our nightcaps, and sleep over the bad times. And perhaps when we wake up, things will have grown better. Some such conduct on their part would have entailed upon us a heritage of error. Age after age would have gone down into infernal depths, and bogs of error would have swallowed all. These men love the faith and the name of Jesus too well to see them trampled on. It is today, as it was in the Reformers' days, decision is needed. Here is the day for the man. Where is the man for the day? We who have had the gospel passed on to us by martyrs' hands dare not trifle with it, nor sit by and hear it denied by traitors who pretend to love it, but inwardly, abhor every line of it. Look you, sirs, there are ages to come. If the Lord does not speedily appear, there will come another generation and another. And all these generations will be tainted and injured if we are not faithful to God and his truth today. We've come to a turning point in the road. If we turn to the right, our children and our children's children will go that way. But if we turn to the left, Generations yet unborn will curse our names for having been unfaithful to God and His Word. There are lines of truth that we today must stand for. Cost whatever it may, we need to be valiant for the truth. Let us pray. Our Father, we do thank you once again for your holy word. We thank you, Lord, that we're not left to our own inventions, our own imaginations, but Lord, you have given to us your word, which is clear and complete, and it is sufficient for us. We thank you, Lord, that you have drawn lines, that we can clearly see how we are to walk, and Lord, we pray that you would help us to see these lines clearly 
as we go down the road of life. Lord, that we may not cross over on the other side of the line and hit someone head on. Lord, may we see those lines clearly and stay the path. Keep us, Lord, faithful that we may not bring disgrace to you and to your church, the church of Jesus Christ. For it's in his name we ask, as we would ask you to forgive us of our sins.